All right, in this video, let's discuss the microbiology of the human digestive tract. So as always, we'll address the gross uh, anatomy of this organ system. We'll think about how this organ system is defended against microbial infection. And then we'll think about the microbes, the normal kinds of microbes that we find living in this organ system. So again, let's begin with the basic anatomy. So the structure of this gastrointestinal tract or digestive tract. So the gastrointestinal tract is this internal tube or, uh, or lumen that passes through the body. So we talk about this uh, tube beginning at the mouth and ending at the anus. And an important thing about this tube is that only the substances we want to gain access to the body, like the nutrients from the food that we eat, should be able to cross the um, tissue layers separating the inside of the gastrointestinal tract from the rest of the body. All right, so in a way, the inside of the gastrointestinal tract is considered outside the body. It's a little counterintuitive because certainly our digestive tract is inside of us, but the contents of the gastrointestinal tract have not gained access to any other organ systems in the body. All they can do is touch the epithelial layers um, surrounding the digestive tract. So keep that in mind as we talk about diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, we'll talk about the few major structures of the digestive tract. Again, we'll begin at the beginning, the opening, the mouth, and then we'll proceed to the end. So after the mouth, we'd have the structures like the pharynx and esophagus. Then we end up in the stomach. After the stomach, we go to the small intestines, then the large intestines, and then the rectum and the anus. Right, so again, this is a tube connecting the mouth and the anus. It runs through the body. We can perform food digestion in there and then extract the nutrients from that food and absorb the nutrients into the body. And we leave behind, quote, outside of the body, all of the undigested material and the things that are not useful nutrients for the body. Um, along with these core structures of the digestive tract, there are also some accessory organs that are required so that the digestive tract can function correctly. So these are considered part of the digestive tract um, and there are infections of some of these organs. So these will be things like the salivary glands, for example, they can be infected during mumps. Um, we've got the liver, so hepatitis infects the liver, gallbladder, pancreas. Um, these other organs are, again, essential for gastrointestinal function. Uh, the last thing we'll say about structure and terminology is that we might hear several names for this organ system. So again, gastrointestinal tract, uh, digestive tract, or alimentary canal are all ways of referring to the same organ system. All right, so let's next think about the features of the gastrointestinal tract that defend it against microbial disease. And some of these are gonna be very familiar from other organ systems, and some will be unique to this organ system. So uh, like some other organ systems, specifically the um, reproductive tract and the respiratory tract, the GI tract depends on mucus for protection. So that mucus will be a sticky covering over the epithelial tissues um, that will trap microbes in it, and it makes it harder for microbes to gain access to the epithelial tissue layers. So it's harder for them to get there. Uh, like other organ systems, the GI tract is rich in secretory antibodies. So we put a lot of things in our mouth every day, food, we, follow, we swallow a lot of things. Evolutionarily, our body understands that our gastrointestinal tract is a place that we will be exposed to a lot of pathogens. So we um, maintain a high concentration of immune cells and secretory antibodies in the gastrointestinal tract so that we can detect those pathogens early, defend ourselves, and um, stay away from infection and disease. So again, those two are common to other organ systems. 
The next one we'll list is peristalsis. This is unique to the gastrointestinal tract. So what is peristalsis? Peristalsis is this um, coordinated set of muscle contractions that lead to the constant progression of material through the gastrointestinal tract. So here is a diagram to try to represent that. As we consume food, the muscles in our digestive tract contract behind a bolus of food, trying to force it down and through the gastrointestinal tract. This peristalsis, or constant movement of material through the gastrointestinal tract, means that it's relatively hard for microbes to stay put in one spot. So it's hard for a microbe to adhere and remain in a single part of the gastrointestinal tract causing an infection. You, most microbes are constantly pushed out. So that helps defend our gastrointestinal tract against disease. Um, our gastrointestinal tract also has a number of chemical defenses associated with different fluids in the body. So for example, saliva, we secrete enzymes in our saliva, digestive enzymes that can attack microbes, uh, microbial cells. Uh, we've got our stomach fluid, which is highly acidic, right? And that is a very difficult place for microbes to survive. Bile has antimicrobial properties. So throughout the gastrointestinal tract, there are also significant chemical defenses. Um, again, with like I said, with the secretory antibodies, the gastrointestinal tract is a place where we know we will be exposed to potential pathogens. So it's important to have our immune cells there ready to protect us. Immune cells are particularly rich in our lymphatic tissue. So the gastrointestinal tract is also closely related to or closely um, aligned with some uh, lymphatic tissue. And that specific set of lymphatic tissues is called the GALT or gastrointestinal associated lymphatic tissue. So GALT is just a way, way of referring to the lymphatic tissue closely associated with the digestive tract. Again, this provides a lot of immune cells and immune capability to protect the um, digestive tract. So structures like the tonsils, adenoids, and then other lymphoid tissues associated with the esophagus and the appendix are all structures that can help protect us from infection. All right, the last thing we'll point out is the important role of microbial antagonism in protecting us from infection. So remember, microbial antagonism just says that we are inhabited by a bunch of normal and healthy microbes. Those microbes are taking up space. They're, they're filling the habitat in and on our body. So if a pathogen shows up, intending to infect one of your tissues, if that tissue is already inhabited by a bunch of healthy microbes, it is much harder for that new pathogen to establish itself because there will be competition from the existing microbial population. So having these microbes inhabit our digestive tract is extraordinarily beneficial to us. They help us digest foods, they keep us healthy, um, and they protect us from pathogens. That's my, microbial antagonism. It's a super important uh, mechanism of protection throughout the body. All right, so let's end by thinking about what kinds of microbes or where we find microbes on uh, within the human digestive tract. So the digestive tract contains a large variety of normal biota. Large is probably not a big enough word. There should, there's a huge diversity of microorganisms associated with the digestive tract. All right, so let's think about um, where we find them. So for example, in our mouths, in the oral cavity alone, scientists have identified more than 550 different species of microorganisms that live in our mouths. So the diversity in our mouth is huge. And that doesn't even tell us how many of each of those microbes are there. And the statistics that, I, that I've always heard, and I think is uh, quite illustrative of the size of the population, is that our mouths contain, right now, 
more microbial cells than there has ever been humans living on Earth. And we know that the population of humans on Earth today is almost 8 billion. And that doesn't even count all the humans that have come before us. So there are billions and billions of microbial cells in our mouths at all time. And they're represented by 550, at least 550 different species. So again, a huge population that is also very diverse. Um, as we progress down the digestive tract, we could think about the esophagus and the stomach. These parts of the digestive tract have much, much fewer microbial cells. So we can think about why the esophagus is a tube we're constantly uh, swallowing boluses of food, and they're sort of scraping the sides of our esophagus every time we swallow. So that makes the esophagus an extraordinarily difficult place for microbes to survive, which means the population there is much smaller. The same is true for the stomach because of the acid. So it's an extraordinarily acidic environment. Very few microbial, microbial cells are acidophilic enough to survive there. So in these structures, if we measure the number of cells per gram of contents, like in the food, there are thousands of cells per gram. Um, that's not very much, especially if we think about what happens in the intestines, the small and the large intestines. So in the intestines, there are billions of microorganisms, 10 to the 11th power, billions of microorganisms per gram of contents. Uh, in fact, one of the statistics you'll often hear is by the time feces is leaving the body, that feces is about 50% bacteria by weight. So half of the waste that we produce from the digestive tract is bacteria. So again, the intestines represent potentially the largest habitat of microorganisms in or on the body. This is where the vast majority of our microbiome lives. And that microbiome is really important. Again, the, those microbes are helping our digestive tract operate correctly, helping us digest food, and they're protecting us from infection. Our relationship with our intestinal microbiome has critical connections to our health. And that's a really interesting area of study in microbiology these days. So that's where we'll end. That's an overview of the digestive tract. Again, I think we've hit the main points for us and that will allow us to consider the effect or the, um, the different diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. So as always, please let me know if you have any questions and I will talk to you all again very soon.